Well, thank you for gathering this evening. Giving the opportunity for the gospel, I think, is a burden I've had on my heart for, I don't know how long. I'm sad that we did close off Sunday night meetings many years ago. Um, it was needful at the time, but I think the time that has lapsed, we have entered a time where we, we can't not put the gospel in the marketplace as best as we are able. There are so many questions being raised in our day. Um, there's such unease and insecurity. There is such uh, a desire for truth because there isn't any. People can't get facts from the government and, and, and trust them that those that do are, are already influenced by the agenda that is behind the direction all nations are traveling. The removal of every aspect of holiness of God, particularly. You know, we, we can certainly understand that there is a morality that people can have because we are made with the laws of God in their hearts. People do respond out of that to, to in, in a certain, certain way and the, the sad part of that, they use that as a means of justification for themselves that they're not that bad, they're, they're not as bad as that person because they look around and compare themselves by one another. But that'll be sad on that day when they look to him who they will have to give an account before and they will not be able to compare themselves with humanity. They will compare themselves with the Son of God. And this is the urgency of the hour. If they don't know him, we're challenged to preach the word and preach the gospel to every creature. And then the end will come. John accounts for this. Peter certainly gives the account of the Great Commission. So this is the basis of this burden, to give every opportunity, wherever the Lord may direct, the ones or twos would come. You know, the, the years of great influx into the kingdom that we've known in, you know, to, in, in uh, the 1901 to 1907, the revivals that happen at different pockets around the globe, particularly citing the Welsh revival 1904, there was a move of God that was unfathomable. We know that in the, the 80s, the, the 70s and 80s, this huge influx into churches took place also. The fruit of that, some remain, but the vast majority have been so influenced by various doctrines that the purity of the gospel is not really there it's clouded and, and, and tainted with self and the personification of what we're going to get out of this life. Paul's admonishment to Timothy comes home to us so clearly when he says, in the last days, men will be lovers of self. We are there. It's not five years, 10 years, 20 years, another generation from now, we find ourselves living in that time now. And yes, through the dispensations of, of, of the church age, it's always repeated itself. We know that, but the intensity is so evident now. So I'm, I'm saying this maybe to justify ourselves of having a meeting, but the urgency, if the ones and twos can hear the gospel, whoever it may be that the Lord would bring through the foolishness of preaching, so be it. And if we would be a fool for the Lord, I'd rather have his encouragement and admonition than side with the world in anything. So I've brought a, a message this evening and it's, it's short and, and hopefully to the point it's not well addressed. I was still working on it even before coming. Um, but we can certainly be encouraged by the scriptures this evening. There are two passages that have the same essence 
dare I say, death is the underlying theme in both of these two passages. But they look at it from two specific perspectives. First passage found in Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. Then the second passage will be John 15, verse 13. They're not parallel. They seem to be almost opposed. But the common theme, as I said, is this aspect of having to surrender one's life. When one's life is taken, death is the underlying aspect. Hebrews 9, verse 27. And it is appointed. Wow, God's appointed. For men to die once, but after this the judgment. And it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. The second passage, John chapter 15, verse 13. John 15 and verse 13. Greater love has no man, no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. Have you ever considered what it is to die? There are many crises through our lives in the life of every mortal, and man must account for what he knows of life, and then he is faced with the life that is to follow death. Poignant times of life, the death of a loved one, the bereavement of a spouse or a child, a a brother, an aunt, an uncle, mothers, fathers, all of us have been touched And it brings to light this question that we are truly not able to fathom this mystery that is a veil blocking our view into what is going to transpire after we expire. Webster's Dictionary, thanks to Mr. Webster, notes what death is or to die, he writes, to be deprived of respiration, of the circulation, sorry, of the circulation of blood and of other bodily functions, and rendered incapable of resuscitation, either by natural decay, by disease, or by violence, to cease to live, to expire, to cease, to perish, and with respect to man to depart from this world. The account in Exodus brought this devastating separation of what was once the apple of a father's life and father's heart, their firstborn. Pharaoh was confronted, Exodus 11, with the death all of all of those in Egypt. But preceding that were the judgments. And the judgments of the gods that Egypt had decided to follow and submitted to. But the final judgment was the angel of death that judged every home. This word to die is followed by of or by, interestingly enough. Men die of a disease, of a fever, of sickness or a fall, of grief. They die by the sword, by famine, by pestilence, by violence, by sickness. Death is to be viewed, if you like, In a justification sense, it is a form of punishment. We know that in Roman times, 
The Roman Empire exacted this incredible means of taking the life, bringing shame, bringing mockery to those who were put to death for their crimes. They were judged. Seemingly, the Roman law saw to it to ensure that those who were to be hung on a tree accounted for everything that they did. In contrast to that, we find the passage in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. In due time, or in the right time, Christ died through the means of the cross, a cruel Roman cross. Who did he die for? He died for the ungodly. Paul recounts in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Christ died for and because of our sins, not for any fault of his own. But his life was taken for the ransom, the payment, the completion of what is due for all who are sinners. And Paul says he writes this according to the scriptures. Christ died, was buried, and on the third day, Christ rose again from the dead. And it's attested to not only by the apostles, but by this one writing the account. Paul attests to it. One as born out of due time, he sees the resurrected Christ who spoke with him. Paul, Paul, why is it that you are persecuting me? Why kick against the goads? And Paul is con confronted with the glory and the splendor of this one who had no sin but took the punishment of sin upon himself. When the breath of life departs a man or a woman, there is a failure to correspond to the realm of men. It's been coined and I've heard it said, death is a failure to correspond. No wrongs to be righted, no forgiveness to be bestowed on one who might have erred in one's life. No looks of love, of compassion can be given. No soft caress to be administered to comfort. No further voice no sound to be made following death. No fist of defiance to be waved against his maker. No further arbitration for self-justification. The religious confronted Jesus. John chapter 5 verse 18 recounts that they sought to kill Jesus. And there is a reason why they sought to put him. It's not just because he was a religious zealot according to them. It's because specifically he claimed to be equal with the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. John chapter 15, and we read, Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he did not only break the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. This brings into focus this verse that we brought first, Hebrews 9, 27. And it is appointed for men to die once. After this, the judgment. Interesting enough, it recounts in John chapter five, the passage that precedes this discourse where Jesus is going to then give a discourse to challenge the thinking of these Jews who, who, who were astounded and flabbergasted at his claims that 
you are saying that you are the son of God, but you are just the son of Joseph. And in John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus begins, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him, the Father, who sent me, the Son, has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. What an amazing statement. Jesus hadn't died at this point. Jesus is speaking beyond human realms. He's speaking of an eternal perspective. If you hear the voice of God the Father through God the Son, you will live. Verse 26, for as the Father has life in himself, so he also granted to the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. Those who are dead Death will not prevail against those whose life is secure in Christ. They will hear that voice and come forth in verse 29. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Here, every human being in the finality of God's time, he will bring all flesh who has ever lived and will ever live. And they will stand before this blessed one, the Lord Jesus Christ, and be judged for what they have done with this one who claimed to be the Son of God. Some unto life, some unto resurrection of condemnation but all will stand under the judgment of this blessed one. Because all human flesh find themselves sinners, estranged from God. But now what of the second verse that we've brought to you? It seems incomprehensible. We've, we're talking about justice and, and penalty and death, this separation, but now, this death seems to have a glory and a majesty and a purpose attached to it. John 15 verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. We've just begun on, most of us really completed the celebration of the remembrance, the Australian New Zealand Army Corps who have secured even with their own lives freedom, freedom that we have been resting in for 70 plus years. No, longer than that, it was, two, it was in the First World War, so it's a lot longer than 70. It's, how long is that? My maths is not, David maths please, how many years? It's 1919 to now, it's 100 years. 100 and, 102 years, that's right. I got there eventually. 102 years ago. And we've rested in what they provided. You think of the legacy that we could now be under its weight of the political regime, the governance if Mussolini, Hitler, and the Japanese empire had had their way on the world stage. 
Yes, there were so many things at play, but thanks be to the Lord, there was still a voice of reason and men who declared, we can't be moved. We must stand for justice. We must stand for what is right, freedom, liberty, based on principles of truth, based on righteousness, the ability to choose what is good and what is evil. The legend of the Anzacs that began in World War I has continued throughout the years. In fact, words like mateship, loyalty and sacrifice are now synonyms with our servicemen and women. Sorry, they are now synonymous. Thank you, love. The words mateship, loyalty and sacrifice are now synonymous with our servicemen and women. However, as we remember those who have served our country in times of war and conflict, let us not forget those who cared for the services service, and served them themselves. One such man was Salvation Army Red Shield representative, an unofficial padre to the rats of Tobruk, Arthur McEwen. In May 1941, Arthur McEwen responded to a faint voice calling from the darkness, Aqua, Aqua. McEwen recalled, I crawled forward in the dark and found a wounded Italian soldier and offered him my water bottle. Instead of taking a drink, the wounded Italian rolled over and held the water bottle to the lips of his wounded comrade. Then he took a single sip for himself, knowing the shortage of water in the desert, and handed the water bottle back to me and said, Grazie. I, th I thought to myself, Australians aren't the only ones to have cobbers. This was not the only time that McEwen showed care and concern for not only those in his own brigade, but even those seen as the enemy. Well known for playing his gramophone with records held together by all kinds of adhesives, it is said McEwen played his records to German and Italian prisoners with as much feeling as he did to his mates. To care for your friends, that's mateship. But to care for your enemies, that takes compassion. And this was the key to this love and compassion for both his friends and his enemies. This verse holds true. No greater love has a man than to lay down his life for his friends. There's this phrase, greater love. That greater love must be understood in the context that it was given. For there's no greater love on display than the love that Christ demonstrated towards us when we were still sinners. Because John 3.16 says, as we know so readily, for God so loved the world, its entirety, even in its sin and its degradation, he loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him, that is in Jesus Christ, shall not die, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son in the into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Greater love, greater love being demonstrated. The writer of that same gospel, John, writes many years later, even on the Isle of Patmos, where he was uh, alienated and subdued to uh, imprisonment, confinement on the island of Patmos. And he's obviously received letters of correspondence 
from those who are in Christ and asking him questions about how do we know those who are truly saved, those who are truly following Jesus Christ, how can we test it? And John writes this after writing that passage, for God so loved the world, he writes this in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. What a contrast of two passages. Death which brings justice and judgment. Death that brings honor and glory to the one who showed greater love has no man than this and to lay down his life. Yes, our soldiers laid down their lives and we, we rest on this measure of grace which seems to be coming to a very abrupt halt. Because that which we love and that which we hold dear is being removed and we are now faced with a decision. When we do die, for it is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. Will we be appointed our portion with those who will earn, inherit eternal life or those who will earn the reward of their self-justification, eternal condemnation? That question must be posed and we must answer. But how can we affirm that we are sitting and resting in what Jesus has provided. Well, we can look to these three main points in conclusion. The three points that will help us equate what Christ has done, where I stand today, and what I need to do about it. The ABCs of the gospel. Firstly, number A, A, admit. A for admit, you are a sinner. Jesus died for sinners. In your admission, your acknowledgement that you are lost, that you are a wretch, that you are ungodly, and you are a sinner. By doing so, you are demonstrating to God the Father that you have humbled yourself to the law of God that brings conviction of sin. You have heard that there is a way that you must choose. You have heard already that we are sinners apart from Christ's sacrifice where he loved unconditionally a greater love that no one can understand unless he sees what Christ has done for him personally and enters into all that he's given. Romans 3.10 as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one, meaning there is no one without sin. Romans chapter three, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans six twenty six. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is why Jesus shed his blood for your sins and died on the cross for your sins. Your admission requires a response and that is repentance. Repentance towards God, the Father, for it is to him and only him that you have sinned against. Repentance means to change your mind, to change your attitude, your soul, to change your will and turn from all sin to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and everything that he has written to us and follow it to prove that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. A, for admit you are a sinner. B, believe Believe Jesus is Lord. Romans chapter 10, verses 
9 and 10. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Risen from the grave to defeat death because the wages of sin is death. Jesus paid our debt in full when we believe that he is Lord. B for believe. A for admit. B to believe Jesus is Lord. And C, call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Confession with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believing in your heart and ask him to forgive you of all sin. And not just a blanket, a, a blanket saying, Lord, just forgive everything I've done. But confession requires naming everything that you can, be, can have brought to your remembrance. Thankfully, we can ask the Lord to reveal that to our hearts and say, Lord, what is it that I have done that has offended you, that has broken your law? Lord, please reveal it so that I can ask for your forgiveness. And miraculously, your mind, your filing cabinet of all the years that you have lived will offer up willingly those things that your conscience knows have destroyed your relationship with God. By the confession of those things individually, naming what they are, every lie, everything that you can remember that's brought to your remembrance, every time you've stolen, cheated, blasphemed, disobeyed your parents, dishonored God, whether you've hated somebody, every aspect that you know that you've broken God's law, confess it. The Bible tells us that Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sin and cleanse us from unrighteousness. Herein lies the three ABCs of how we can be right with God. What were they again? A, to admit you are a sinner. B, believe Jesus is Lord. C, call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have looked to your word. We see these incredible contrasts, Lord. It is appointed under man once to die and then the judgment. Yet at the same time, there is a glory revealed in the beauty that no greater love no greater love has a man than to lay down his life for his friend. Lord, I pray, show us this love. Show us what you have done. Show us where we stand. And Lord, I pray, reveal to us every wickedness in our heart that we may confess it and know that we can be transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It is a work that you do miraculously for those who will call on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. Saved to the uttermost, we pray, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen.